Thanks for uh, letting me uh, present this paper. It's joint work uh, with Kobe Castiel. Um, let me uh, start with uh, giving, uh, with, with mentioning the SNAP IPO example, which illustrates the kind of situation that we have in mind when we talk about small minority controllers. Uh, SNAP went public uh, last year. Uh, as, uh, Many of you uh, know, uh, it was already mentioned in the discussions yesterday. Uh, there was a lot of attention to the fact that SNAP had uh, uh, non-voting shares. But if you look at the media coverage, it talks about the fact that still uh, uh, each of the co-founders had 18% of the equity capital. If you look at the media coverage, however, there wasn't any notice of a fact that to us, and uh, I'll suggest to you in this presentation, is important, and that is that if you look at the fine details, there are arrangements there that I'll, I'll talk about uh, 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 shortly, that would enable the two co-founders to uh, uh, go down to slightly below 1% and still retain uh, uh, control. What we try to do in this paper is uh, to place a spotlight on a subset of dual class structures uh, that we argue are especially problematic, and those are structures in which the controller has now or might be expected down the road to have uh, just a small or even a tiny fraction of equity capital, and uh, we argue that those are especially uh, problematic from a governance perspective, and we analyze various dimensions of those uh, structures. It's part of a series of papers uh, uh, we have been uh, doing on dual class structures. Uh, I want to relate it to a paper uh, uh, that uh, we published uh, uh, last year that has been uh, in circulation for several years before that. Uh, and that's a paper titled The Untenable Case for Perpetual Dual Class Structure. And in that paper, we focused on the time dimension. So uh, we argue that even if you are open for uh, uh, having an, uh, a dual class structure as the efficient arrangement at the time of the IPO, because you buy the argument that is a visionary founder or an especially uh, a valuable founder, and you want them to have control and be insulated from market forces uh, in the years after the IPO, as time passes from the time of the IPO, the dual class structure are, first of all, increasingly, increasingly likely to become inefficient over time. And secondly, even if it does become uh, uh, inefficient over time, private incentives are such that the controller uh, uh, would likely keep the structure in place even if it becomes uh, uh, inefficient. Uh, and we therefore argued for sunset, for sunset provisions. And those provisions, those predictions that we made about how uh, the efficiency of dual class structures is expected to uh, uh, erode over time were subsequently confirmed by, by a couple of empirical papers that were recently uh, issued. This paper, uh, by contrast, focuses on another dimension. So our strategy has been to say, look, even if you uh, concede uh, uh, and that you are open to dual class structures uh, being valuable sometimes, here are subsets of the uh, dual class uh, uh, companies around the world that even the most ardent supporters of dual class structures should uh, feel uh, concerns about. So in this paper, we focus on another dimension, and this is the size of the ownership stake. So uh, the ownership stake uh, matters uh, because if you think about the controller that has a fraction alpha of the equity capital and faces a choice uh, uh, that would decrease the value of the company by delta V, but nonetheless, would provide the controller with a private benefit of B. You can think about the situation in which rejecting an acquisition offer would lose substantial premium, so it would lose delta V, but it would retain the control benefits of being in, in control of this company, so you would lose uh, a B. Uh, 
the controller would take the value decreasing action as long as if, as long as uh, you, you obviously, uh, you all see that, as long as delta V is smaller than beta over alpha. And this range of situation and their cost is expected to increase when alpha declines. And there are two reasons for that, and uh, which uh, we should keep in mind. One is that the range of inefficient choices that would be in the private interest of the controller would expand. And secondly, the extra situations that on the margin would be added to the range of choices, those extra situations would be as ones in which the destruction of value would be especially large, and therefore the expected value uh, uh, of aging costs increases. And this is something that is consistent uh, uh, with some uh, uh, studies in the literature, uh, including by uh, Ron Masulis, who is here, and, and one by uh, uh, Gompers et al. What's important to emphasize, and it's something that uh, uh, was uh, put forward in an early paper by uh, Quark, Montreal, and myself quite some time ago, but that we try to fully develop and flesh out in this paper, is that not only the agency cost increases as alpha goes down, which most people here immediately uh, 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 recognize, but that they increase at an increasingly steep rate as alpha declines. So that if the controller stake goes down uh, uh, from 25% to 24%, agency cost increase, but not by that much. But if it goes down from 2% to 1%, that's only 1% difference. But agency cost, the expected level of agency cost grows massively. I mean, if you look uh, uh, at the calculus, uh, uh, the range of inefficient uh, uh, choices doubles. And moreover, the cases that are in added to this range on the margin are, are worse, and things can get uh, are really bad. I have here a numerical example, but in the interest of time, let, let's not go uh, through it. I just I can give you the intuition another way. Uh, uh, controllers that have a limited fraction have an incentive to reject acquisition offers that would take away their control, even if they offer a very large premium. Uh, uh, if you are, if you uh, uh, equity stake goes down from 4% to 2%, that would double the premium that you would require in order to give up your control. So the cost, the efficiency cost of that might be very large indeed. We explain the paper that we illustrate this. Uh, this is kind of a basic structural problem. And we discuss how there is a wide range of corporate contexts in which it can be expected to manifest itself. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, indeed, uh, in any dimension, and we talk about not only the things that people talk about in context of agency problems like created party transactions and allocation of opportunities and talents, but your decision whether to continue to lead the company or not, your choice of business strategy, your choices about the scale and what investments to make, your response to acquisition offers. We explain how each of them is subject to this uh, a structural force. Next, uh, we uh, 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 um, put forward, uh, we can identify and analyze each of the legal and contractual mechanisms that have been used in the marketplace and have been evolved uh, uh, with the creativity of uh, uh, um, you know, smart and creative lawyers and deal designers uh, uh, to enable uh, uh, this uh, uh, possibility of small minority controllers. There are governance provisions that just hardwire, no matter how uh, low your alpha goes, that hardwire uh, uh, your power to uh, uh, control votes and to the choice of directors. Obviously, the ratio of high votes to low votes in a dual class structure matters. Non-voting stock is a case of infinite ratio. Uh, 
of high voting to low voting. Uh, controllers often have uh, the ability to convert. Uh, uh, so when they sell, when they want to get cash and they sell their shares, uh, uh, to avoid the dilution of their control, they can have the shares that they sell convert from uh, uh, high vote to low vote. Uh, they also have automatic conversion for others. So it means that uh, uh, if you look at the data, you see, for example, that Mark Zuckerberg had a smaller fraction of the vote when he went public than when he had, or when he has now. When he went public, he had less than 50% of the votes. Now he has more than 50% of the votes, even though he cashed some of his shares. Why is that? Because when he went public, other pre-IPO investors, mainly the VC firms, had some of the high voting shares, and therefore he had uh, uh, substantially less than 50%. But when the VC firms sell, their shares are automatically converted to low voting shares. So even though he, he sold a fair amount of shares, he sold less than the VCs, so he ended up with more than 50%. Uh, um, there is the possibility of distributing dividends in low vote shares. Uh, uh, there is the power of the controller to make midstream governance changes that would magnify some of the mechanisms. You know, there is legal arrangement, contractual arrangements are very rich. We have, for people who are into it, you know, there is a lot uh, uh, of discussion of this in the paper. For people who are not into it, let me move on. So, uh, uh, just to illustrate how it works in the case of SNAP, people focus on the fact that there are non-voting shares there, but if that's the only thing that they had there, you wouldn't have this 1% number that I gave you in the beginning. Why? Because right now they have the high voting shares. But if they want to cash out some of the holdings, uh, uh, they would be able just to sell a limited fraction before they lose control. But what happens there is that there are 2.4 billion non-voting shares that are authorized but not yet issued. What it means is that if the funders want to cash out, what they would be expected to do is not to sell any of the non-voting shares. They would be advised not to do, sorry, the super voting shares. They wouldn't sell any of those. If they want cash, they would just distribute uh, 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 some or all of those uh, authorized but not issued uh, non-voting shares. That would seem unobjectionable because it would go pro rata. Everybody would uh, uh, be the same. But then they, when they would sell, they would be just selling the non-voting shares. And then they would not be losing any votes whatsoever. In this way, they can cash out up to 95% of the cash flow rights, which would still keep them with an absolute lock on control, but uh, uh, they would get to below 1% of the cash flow rights. And that's what gives, gets you to the 1%, which is something that, interestingly, none of the large media coverage of the SNAP IPO uh, are focused on. There are some sunset arrangements, but they're not really, uh, 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 as they are currently designed, they're not really an effective constraint. In SNAP, the sunset is defined as long as they have a certain percentage of the super voting shares, there is no sunset. But as I explained to you just a moment ago, the way they would cash out is not by selling the super voting shares. They would continue to hold a very large fraction. They would just do this other maneuver and therefore the sunset would never be triggered. Now, we try to provide, we put forward empirical evidence. Uh, 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 it's really facts. It's, it's not uh, 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 empirical analysis. It's facts about the incidence of this, of this problem. So we, we introduced those terms, controlling minority shareholders is the term that Quarkman and Triantis and I uh, 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 introduced. It's an old term. A controller that has more than 50% of the votes but less than 50% of the equity capital. But the other uh, concepts are small minority controller. When you have less than 50% of the equity capital, very small minority, it's when you have less than 10%, and tiny minority is if you have less than 
uh, and what uh, our RAs and us, we went through the governance documents to look at uh, 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 the documents that are there and how they interact with each other. And we tried to figure out what is the current function of equity capital, which is not always transparent that the controller has, and what is the lowest equity stake that the controller could go down to and still have uh, uh, absolute control. Um, on the left, you have the current incidence. Uh, um, and you, know, you see that small minority, very small minority, and tiny minority, they are meaningfully represented. Uh, but on the right-hand side, you see the risk of how things can develop uh, uh, over time. Among dual-class companies uh, in our large uh, data set, slightly more than one-third have governance arrangements in place that would enable the controller to go below 5%, which we call tiny minority controller. We chose 5% because 5% is the threshold that if you had one share, one vote, the law wouldn't even require you to disclose your presence there. With less than 5%, you would have less equity than BlackRock or Vanguard on State Street in all likelihood in your company. But you would still have, you would have probably less than one set of the equity capital that they would have combined. But you would have an absolute control over the destiny of the company. Uh, let me go next to policy implications, and I should pause here and connect this to the large questions that came up yesterday of uh, uh, whether we should intervene in contractual freedom and whether we can count on IPO choices to be optimal. And that's a big question that people discuss elsewhere, uh, uh, I've written about, but we don't try to contribute to it in this <laughs> Uh, paper, it's obviously a big question, which people have different views. Now, if you subscribe to the view that IPO choices are optimal because of the jensen meckling mechanism, uh, uh, then obviously whatever the market in its wisdom produces, you accept. Uh, uh, and then what you might take from our paper, might, our paper might still have value for you in the sense that you might say, I still respect whatever. I don't want to constrain any choices. But this might be an interesting set of observations for what investors should be uh, uh, assessing when they look at structures. And maybe if they understand it, maybe the market will work differently and so forth. Maybe I want to improve disclosure. If you don't describe to this view, or if you are not religious about it, and you are open to the possibility that there are imperfections, and then you think that there is a trade-off, and if you are very sure uh, uh, that some structures are bad, like no fiduciary should do this or inside trading, you are willing to intervene, then what we suggest to you is that those structures are ones where we should feel a high degree of confidence uh, uh, that they are bad. Like in our earlier paper, we argued that the dual class structures without a sunset at some point is highly likely to be bad. And therefore, if you belong to that view, of, uh, then uh, uh, you might take our paper and draw some policy, other type of policy implications. Anyway, what are the policy implications? Those are things that either investors, institutional investors, should be uh, 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 looking uh, uh, to see in those structures or that public officials should consider. One is we should make things more transparent. So I mentioned that our RA uh, 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 have worked very hard, and actually we have now another team of RAs that are expanding the data set and uh, 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 equally working hard. And that's because this stuff is actually not transparent. Even the equity stakes are not always uh, uh, transparent, because sometimes they just tell you the controller controls, say, 5% of the vote, but they might control it through an entity that they don't have all the cash flows in that entity. Certainly, the minimum fraction, so the risk of how things will unfold over time, that number is never given. So the 1% uh, uh, in the SNAP case was not given by the company, even though it uh, can calculate it easily. And we think this should be made transparent to investors. 
the SEC Investor Advisory Committee uh, picked uh, up this uh, suggestion and endorsed the proposal, and uh, maybe the SEC will adopt it as well. At least we hope. Secondly, investors might consider pushing for, or if you believe in intervening in choices, public officials might consider encouraging or requiring some arrangements that would prevent such structures or at least prevent them from worsening over time. So uh, there are a number of ways we describe in the paper that can be done. Thirdly, even if you are unwilling to intervene in the size of the wedge as it were or how it unfolds over the time or, or how much it worsens over time, you might, say, you might say in assessing the agency problems in any given company, in any given dual class structure, we have to take into account the equity stake and therefore if we are regulators or public officials or judges, that's a major dimension that we should take into account when we uh, uh, examine a case or make requirements. So for example, when judges examine a related party transaction, they might take into account the equity stake. When the equity stake is sufficiently small, we might consider limiting the controller's power. So for example, we might say the controller we would give the controller the power to choose directors and to determine the business strategy of the company, but the controller, if they have only 5%, shouldn't be able to amend the charter and the bylaws and shouldn't be able, for example, to do uh, uh, a further worsening of, of those arrangements. Uh, uh, you might say in those cases, we don't, we might limit the exemption from independence requirements. Uh, uh, in an earlier paper, Asaf Hamdani and I proposed, and we think that there is a, a very good case, or the case is strengthened in small minority situations. We proposed that some of the independent directors should be made somewhat accountable to public investors by getting the approval for their election of public investors. The Amex used to require this. Some other countries have it. And we think that this requirement makes, or the case for such a requirement is especially powerful in a case when the controller is a small minority or a tiny minority controller. And lastly, uh, uh, we argue that we should uh, uh, prevent the controller in midstream from making things worse using their current voting power and uh, 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 that can be done either by having arrangements uh, uh, at the outset or if uh, uh, there are not there, courts uh, uh, using existing doctrines should be willing to demand uh, majority approval from public investors for any changes that would enable the controller to further reduce ownership stake without relinquishing control. So to conclude, uh, small minority controllers, we argue, uh, pose especially large governance risks and have the potential to, de to generate large agency problems. They are introduced by a wide range of interacting governance arrangements that our paper identifies and that we empirically documented the use, kind of the incidence of each one of them. The incidence of those structures, it's not limited to some uh, well-known examples, but it's uh, now large and more importantly, that's kind of a key message of our, uh, the fact that we document that it can be expected to evolve uh, 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 in a worsening direction uh, uh, over time. We don't have transparency and you might want to consider additional disclosure. And lastly, that if you are willing to consider interventions when you think that problems are especially large, then you should consider two types of interventions. One is to limit or regulate either the initial or the emergence over time of small minority controller structures, or at least 
when you do have small minority control uh, structures, to have more investor protecting arrangements than you would be inclined to have in a situation where you have a controlling shareholder, but one that has a majority or at least a large equity stake. Thank you. What I would like to uh, uh, start my discussion with is just a brief history of, uh, of, of England in about two minutes, not, not the entire history of the country, just, just on dual class shares. And what I think is interesting, in the 1930s, and really prior, I would say, to 1950, there, there were no dual class shares uh, in England. And, and it's kind of interesting because the 1948 Companies Act was a really important uh, act for investor protection. So prior to that, just a virtually a complete absence except for preference shares. That's the only exception. By 1965, more than 11% of listed companies had dual class shares. And when I say dual class shares, I don't mean this fussy stuff about 10 to 1. There were voting shares and there were non-voting shares. Uh, most of the companies with these dual class structures were family companies. Uh, you know, Carriage Brewery, Barclays Bank, Great Universal Stores, Marks and Spencers. And the, these dual class structures were put in place to defend the company against hostile tender offers, which had really risen their head in, in, in the uh, early 1950s. What is interesting is by the 1980s, these dual class structures had virtually disappeared. An exception, Schroeder's a family company for about 300 years, which has still got a dual class share today. But there are maybe two or three companies on the premium market with dual class shares. And it's interesting that there was no corporate law prohibiting dual class shares. Uh, I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, the, the, the reasons for the disappearance of these dual class structures was first the institutions got together and said, we're not going to subscribe to an IPO that has a dual class structure, period. So there were no IPOs with dual class structures. And secondly, the stock exchange said, well, we, we, we're not going to prohibit these dual class structures. But by the way, if you raise new equity capital, we'll have a listing rule in place. You can't have a dual class structure. You'll have to fold it into one. And so all the companies I've mentioned, when they raised a, a, a rights issue, they folded into, in, into one. It was only in, nine, it was only in 20, 2014 when the statutory authority, that is the listing authority, which used to be the London Stock Exchange, but is now the Financial Conduct Authority, which is independent of the Stock Exchange, they brought in a rule that there could be no dual class structures in the premium market. And that was important because if you wanted to get in an index, you had to be in the premium market. And secondly, the standard market where you could have dual class structures. You know, there are a lot of companies with dubious reputation. A lot of them, I regret to say, are foreign, but there it is. Uh, and you, you, you really don't want that kind of company. Uh, so, and it's just interesting to ask, you know, why uh, is our experience uh, so different from that of the United States? And if you look at the Financial Conduct Authority's justification of prohibiting dual class shares. It's not, there's very little economics there. They, they, in fact, they didn't consult any economists. They just consulted uh, practitioners. And they talk about one share, one vote, as though it is the 11th commandment, maybe even the 12th. But this is a religious experience in, the, in their belief in one share, one vote. And secondly, they talk about phrases like level playing fields, fair play. Now, you really have to understand the game of cricket to understand these phrases. And I, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have enough time. I had, <laughs> I had got a slide on this, but time you know, prevents me showing it to you. But this is not really about economic efficiency. And, and I'm reminded about yesterday's very interesting panel discussion, where with the exception of one case where they refer, ref, uh, referred to Lucian's paper, uh, broadly speaking, there was very little discussion of the economics or the evidence required for or against dual class shares. It, it, it reminded me of this kind of UK religious experience. Uh, so 
an interesting question which I'm not going to address. Why is the UK different from the US? Uh, I also think it, it is interesting because I'm among so many lawyers. It's interesting to point out that, that the UK is very prescriptive on ownership rules. We have a 3% disclosure rule. We have a 30% mandatory uh, 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 takeover rule. We have a 12% kind of intentions rule, a little bit like my mother-in-law before I got married, wanted to know my intentions. Well, this is the equivalent <laughs> of 12%. You have to state your intentions, what you're going to do with it. Conversely, with bankruptcy rules, until 2002, there was no bankruptcy law in the United Kingdom. There were bankruptcy procedures. The role of the, of the courts was to enforce the debt contract and to standardize it. But otherwise, so there's great contrast between a highly prescriptive takeover set of rules, ownership of, set of rules, and on the other hand, bankruptcy, which is not unimportant. It was pretty well the courts will enforce the contract. Uh, I, I'm not going to talk too much about what is in, uh, you know, if, if, if you like, the, the model, the description. It's an extraordinary detailed description of the corporate charter and the IPO prospectuses. The only thing that I, will t I, I, I want to talk about is just to stress this table two second column, where what Lucian is very worried about is that the discretion afforded to the controller will allow them to severely dilute the voting power of the outside or public shareholders. And you know, his tiny minority controller who has a majority of the votes, but less than 5%, his concern is it's possible this could really cover more than a third of all companies with dual class shares. And I, and I have to say, if I thought if the divine hand, and it is the... The, the Sabbath today, but if the divine hand told me that this was going to happen, I too would be, would be worried. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure. I, I have some doubts whether it will come to pass, but more of that later. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the evidence. And uh, in, 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 in the United States, about 20% of the Fortune 500 firms are family controlled. And about 80% of them have dual class shares. So there's a tremendous overlap between dual class structures or control enhancing mechanism and family firms. So it's quite important to look at the performance of these uh, firms. And I'm going, to, I'm going to very selectively look at the evidence. Uh, first of all, the international evidence is that family firms that don't use control enhancing mechanisms, they outperform non-family firms. But when you introduce control enhancing mechanisms, they underperform, and they underperform for precisely the reasons that Lucien gave, private benefits of, of control, uh, expropriation, etc. What I think is interesting, since we're talking about the United States, is this the case in the US? Is it as clear in the US? And I don't think it is as clear the U.S. is extraordinarily good at preventing uh, expropriation and, and enforcing it much better than I, than I, than I think uh, in the U.K. So I, I think what's the evidence for this? And the evidence is less clear. And I quote uh, Villa Longa and Amit. I'm going to refer to some more papers. Minority shareholders are likely to be better off, at least no worse off in family firms than they would have been in non-family firms. Founder CEO firms with control enhancing mechanisms are about 25% more valuable than non-family firms. So it's kind of interesting. They start off, at least at the IPO stage, as being more valuable. And I'm going to show you a bit more evidence on that. Now, I think, and, and this, uh, Lucien slightly alluded to this, we're not just interested in the performance of family uh, firms or family controlled firms with uh, control enhancing mechanisms. The question is, what is the size of their private benefits? What's the size of the expropriation? And I think we need some evidence on that. I mean, I, I'm going to quote a little bit of evidence. But even then, even if I can show you that there are private benefits and they're significant, the question is, to what extent are they internalized in the pricing of the IPO? If the seller bears all these costs, then are we re should we really lose any sleep? And, and I would argue I wouldn't lose very much sleep if the seller uh, 
bears all the costs. It's only if the public shareholders bear some of the costs of these uh, private benefits that, that I would really uh, lose sleep. There's some other evidence on dual class shares. And I'm, again, I am going to be selective. Uh, and I'll tell you in a moment why. There's a Renee's paper, which was quite important because the European Commission wanted to abolish dual class shares. And uh, I, I think her paper was quite important in restraining them. I, I think it's not unfair to say it was on the cusp, on the fence, arguments against, arguments for. Uh, there, there, there's obvious evidence on private benefits of control. It's rather stale evidence, which is unfortunate. This is the Dyke Zingales, the Nanova evidence, that voting premiums, although high, when you come to high investor jurisdictions, high protection investor jurisdictions, the voting premiums are close to zero, that is in the Scandinavian countries, between 4 and 10% in the United States. Uh, it'll be interesting to update this, but I think it is an important question. What evidence do we have on the size of expropriation in the United States? If it's small, we don't lose any sleep. If it's large, then it's more significant. Although, as I say to you, who bears these costs is very important. Now, the, the Gompers paper is very much in line, I think, with uh, uh, Lucian's own thinking. But there is this interesting working paper by Kramers et al. that looks at the life cycle of US dual class shares. Uh, dual class shares survive longer, that's to be expected. The incidence of takeovers is lower. They do not underperform a match sample of firms without multiple classes. That's very important because if you thought that they public shareholders internalized part of the cost, you would expect them to underperform. So that's kind of interesting evidence. The, just as Lucian says, the wedge does widen, widens from 16 to 29 percent. This is the wedge between voting and cash flow rights. And that is significant. I, I'm not sure it's dramatic. So that gives me some comfort that, that Lucian's w worst case scenario, we, we, we won't see that happen. Uh, but that's kind of a view. And very importantly, dual class shares, uh, do I dare say using Tobin's Q? I suppose I, I have to. They stand at an 11% premium at the IPO stage, but this does dissipate over time. And, and that's again consistent with uh, uh, the, 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 uh, an earlier paper by Lucia. So in that sense, there's, there's I think, some comforting evidence for those of us who, you know, are, are, are uncomfortable about uh, introducing uh, con con contractual constraints. But there is certainly some evidence that after a while, uh, outperformance uh, is dissipated. Uh, I think Lucien uh, compares dual class shares with minority controllers with dispersed companies. I, I, I think it's an interesting comparison, but I don't think the result is obvious. Uh, dispersed uh, ownership has been described in England as the ownerless corporations until recently. Uh, institutional shareholders were not particularly active, and the market for, co for corporate control is expensive and uh, uh, really has very uh, low, relatively low activity. And interestingly, even for families that relinquish control, they're still disproportionately represented on the boards of companies. There's something about family ownership, a pre-commitment device, maybe to quality, etc., that companies still value. So I, let me say, I, I think uh, Lucian's paper is incredibly thoughtful. Uh, uh, it's thought-provoking, and it has a wonderful set of data, uh, far superior in detail than any other paper on dual class shares that, that I have read. Uh, I, I agree with the more disclosure, uh, both for current holdings and for future holdings. I think that's a no-brainer. I think also better judicial oversight. I think that's also uh, very important and very valuable. Uh, I am, though, worried that by constraining the space, the contractual space, uh, these companies may not list. And we've already lost in number, not in value, 
over half the companies on domestic companies on the US and London stock exchanges. In 1995, there were 2,100 listed companies. There are now about 875, 900. We, what we've seen is, uh, to borrow a phrase from Mike Jensen, is the partial eclipse of the public corporation. So the idea of constraining this even more, I, I have to say as, a, as an aside, that the UK has the lowest proportion of, of domestic family firms in Europe. Roughly 10% of listed companies are family controlled. And, and one reason, I think, is we don't allow control enhancing mechanisms. So I, I think there is a cost to this. Now, when I suggested yesterday uh, to, uh, that we have an index with and without dual class shares, or with and without Lucian's small, very small, or tiny uh, uh, controllers, uh, I thought it was interesting, the response of the panel. One panelist said, yes, we'll do anything for money. Yes, by all means, let's, 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 let's have this. Uh, and, and the second said, I don't think there will be a demand for this. If you are a, offer a 500 or a 450, everybody will go for the 500. What does that tell us? That tells us that they think these shares will perform rather well. If they thought they were overpriced, if they thought that they were somehow bearing some of the cost of the private benefits, they would rush for the 450. But no, this, this uh, proposal won't work because they'll all go for the 500. That, that signals something about the, the expected performance of these dual class structures. My, my, my final comment is I want to go back to the centerpiece of this paper, which is a worry about very small controllers, small controllers and tiny. That is where you have majority votes, but you have very tiny shares. My guess is that institutional pressures, etc., will constrain, uh, will constrain uh, these firms from diluting as far as, uh, as, as, far as uh, Lucien uh, suggests. But I have to say, if the divine hand told me this morning uh, that this is not going to happen, we are going to end up in, in uh, Lucien's place, then I, I think I would seriously consider, let's say, a sunset cause. But my sunset cause would not be after four years. It would be after 24 years. That is a generation. Uh, I think two, four years is just far, far too short. I'd kind of let the founder CEO, uh, uh, you know, uh, retire or die in office and then put in an, an effective sunset course. But on the whole, I don't think we have the evidence yet that these firms underperform, that the private benefits are very large, and most important, that the public shareholders bear a significant proportion of the costs. That is the kind of evidence we need to severely constrain the contracting space. There was a lot in uh, Julian's uh, uh, rich uh, discussion. Thanks a lot for it, Julian. Let me just um, uh, react to three points that uh, Julian made. One is how big a deal is that? And he was saying, look, expropriation in the US might not be that large. So I want to make clear that the agency problems that we are most concerned about are not the ones that kind of come to mind when you hear the word expropriation. We're not talking about uh, related party transactions and the controller taking cash out at night and all kinds of bad things that the wonderful courts in the US would prevent. But just take two econ standard economic decisions that many of the people here uh, worry about a decision whether to sell the company. We all think that can be a first order economic significance. And a decision who is going to make the strategic decisions for the firm. So consider a controller of a 10 billion company that has 10% of the shares. Okay? And let's suppose that an acquisition would increase value from 10 billion to 12 billion, or that if we change, the controller has been running this company for 25 years, he's out of it, somebody else might increase value to 12 billion. Would the, so, you know, 2 billion is not small change. 
would the controller agree to that? Well, the controller, if they went along, they would move from having 1 billion to 1.2 billion. However, from somebody who leads a great operation, they would become you know, a person who has a nice portfolio and a lot of money. And with 1 billion, you, know, you can live a good life. So the controller might well say, I prefer to have just 1 billion and continue my legacy and lead this enterprise to have extra 200 million. So that's the kind of an example about economic decisions, not expropriation, that might be massively distorted. And the main point is that uh, uh, the distortion would massively increase. So if you move from 10% to 5%, they might be willing to destroy in this example. They might be willing to forego uh, uh, 4 billion. So if they are offered 14 billion, they might give this up. Second point quickly, Julian said there, is, there are going to be pressure from institutional investors who might place a limit on this. But actually, the one set of companies in the US that are not really responsive to institutional investor pressures are the companies with dual class structure. Because they don't care about withhold votes. I think maybe even Matthew from BlackRock said yesterday that those companies, maybe they said it just in conversation, but I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, evidence that those companies are not for understandable reasons. They're not very responsive to pressure from institutions because say on pay or withhold votes, they don't care about those. And lastly, the main argument that is usually made is, look, those companies are not going to list, and therefore we lose them. <coughs> and I think, we think, and then we wrote this uh, in our earlier paper, that that's a concern that uh, uh, might not be as large as it seems. Why? Because if, if, this, if the rules were different, the founders of those companies don't really have an option to get capital in a world in which, because most people say, look, now we have unicorns. Some companies remain private for a longer period of time. But all the people who give the money in the private market, it's all because they expect two, five, 10 years out to have an exit to the public market. If people went to the pri private providers of capital and said, look, you give me the money, and I'll be in control for the next 50 years, they'll laugh. They'll say, we'll give you, if you, if you went to private equity firms or to venture capital firms and you said, you give me money and I just control it for the next 50 years, they're not going to give you money. They're giving you money right now because they expect you to, have an, to offer them an exit down the road. And if the rules of the exit were such that and by the way, they, the venture capital firms usually require some part of the control rights. They are willing to give them up when you go public and when they have an exit. But if the situation were such that giving them the exit required you uh, uh, to have a one share one, one vote structure, they would have at the outset some arrangement that would assure that. Right. Thank you. Wouldn't the private equity investor right at the beginning uh, actually try to put some kind of pressure on the firm to guarantee that he wouldn't uh, have a dual class shares or at least not uh, in the extreme uh, way that uh, you were describing? So, I mean, you said before that these sure. people are not uh, responsive to institutional investors, but Right now, you seem to be saying that at the beginning, institutional investors do play a role, at least, I mean, private equity investors do right. play a role. Wouldn't they try to affect the future trajectory right. of, um, uh, you know, sure. issuance in one way or another? Is there like a legal way of doing that? Sure. No, there's definitely a legal way of doing it. Now, obviously, what they are doing at the outset is based on their expectations. <laughs> 
as to what markets would be willing to receive down the road. Yeah. Okay. Now, right now, they're operating under the assumption that you'll be able to have an exit even with a dual class structure. They'll be able to get their money out within three years, and uh, 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 that's it. Now, if you are fully contractarian and you believe in the beauty of the IPO mechanism, then uh, um, everything will work. Why? Because even the IPO, it would be prevented. And also, going back one step, they will anticipate it and say, we want you to ensure that you'll have this or that structure. Okay. So you have to worry only if you do not fully rely, only if you are not fully religious about the beauty and the pricing mechanism of the IPO that everything will work. So I was responding just to another argument. So if you accept that the IPO mechanism isn't perfect, but you make the claim that, look, we are going to lose those companies, for that I was saying you are not going to lose those companies because even if the IPO mechanism isn't perfect, uh, if there isn't an option to go public with certain structures, then the venture capital firms would require at the outset when they give you money, they would have some legal mechanisms in place that would prevent this. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think it was a very good paper that Lucien presented. And I also support what Julian said, because I think that's more similar to Singapore's situation, where um, we recently adopted and decided to actually push through with uh, dual class shares. As I think a lot of you know, Singapore and Hong Kong, we compete on to, um, you know, to attract people to list in Asia. So um, that was one of the consideration. And the main difference between the Singapore a dual class shares and um, structure and the Hong Kong structure is that Hong Kong is limited just for high tech companies, which means that your um, company that's going to be listed, it's like um, Facebook or which is tech base. But the Singapore situation, it's actually, we don't have that restriction. So which is more, more open and the main idea is actually to attract family firms, which may not fall into the category of um, you know, tech companies. So what Singapore has done is actually to, to put more restraint on the controllers. That means the, 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 the people who are going to be listed and having um, smaller uh, capital in that sense, um, to put them as directors. That means one of the criteria is that they have to remain as on the board. And because I guess under um, Singapore law and under, you know, common, common law system, um, Directors' duties are more stringent and more likely to be enforced as compared to the U.S. structure. So putting them that one of the criteria is that they have to maintain as directors, that will put the, put the additional fiduciary duties on them. So that may be one of the main differences between um, you know, the British system and the American system. Yeah, the, the, this uh, strategy of saying, uh, there is a sunset when you leave the board. That's kind of one uh, legal way of uh, uh, trying to uh, um, have a sunset when the original visionary leader is no longer around. Our view, and that was more in the earlier paper when we argued for sunset, is that that isn't sufficient. It isn't sufficient for two reasons. One is that just having a person on the board does not mean that they are the right person to lead the company after a sufficiently long period of time. So even if they are eager to lead, uh, uh, that um, you know, some great leaders might turn to be very bad leaders 20 years uh, uh, down the road. And also there is the question of, I mean, technically, requiring somebody on the board to be on the board is not a good way to require them to be an actual leader. Uh, uh, kind of a poster child example of what happens, uh, uh, can happen to a dual class structure over time. Some of you might have followed the CBS Viacom saga, where Samuel Redstone was a great leader in the 1990s. 
25 years later, unfortunately, with life being what it is, he was no longer able to remember the name that was given to him, I mean, the positions, and wasn't able to uh, talk very much. But he still remained as a director of the company uh, uh, for two years uh, and was removed or, or left the board only when some evidence uh, surfaced that raised questions about his legal competence. And legal competence is not exactly the threshold we would like to have for what's a good director. It's, it's a very uh, uh, limited, uh, I would, yeah. Well, let me rephrase uh, the question of yesterday. Why are we focusing on one share, one vote, while there are several methods to separate ownership from control? Shouldn't we, since we want to disclose one share, one vote, why don't we disclose all the other potential ways we can separate the two. Like what, give, what we like have from in mind? poison pills uh, to groups, uh, foundations, right. I don't know. Uh, sure, so, so I think that, uh, I think that anti-takeover provisions raise concerns. I am among the people who uh, uh, have written about this. So my, my view is not sympathetic to them. Dual class structures provide probably in the US the most extreme uh, uh, protection for market pressure is much more powerful than any of the anti-takeover provisions that are available. Pyramids and cross holdings, uh, uh, they present similar problems to dual class structures. Indeed, kind of the earlier paper by Triantis, Quarkman, and myself that I mentioned is a paper that kind of discussed the analytical or the economic equivalence, how you can basically produce any level of separation using each of those uh, three mechanisms. So you can think about uh, uh, the analysis here as equally applying to tiny minority controller uh, 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 structures uh, in pyramids or in cross holdings because it's a paper that focuses mainly on the US and people have been focusing on dual class structures. We limited it to dual class structures, but uh, actually personally, I'm equally skeptical of pyramids and for better or for worse, I was kind of the expert to a committee in Israel that produced a report that led to a legislation that dismantled the corporate pyramids in Israel, which you know, what you view about it would depend on how much of a contractarian you are. But in Israel, they adopted legislation uh, uh, that basically there was there were elaborate business groups. Uh, dual class structures were prohibited in Israel 25 years ago, but instead you had corporate pyramids and that legislation uh, uh, precluded pyramids by requiring a maximum of two layers and preventing any structure that had more than two layers. So with two layers, the most you can have is controlling minority shareholder, but not even a very small, because you are limited to about 20% of equity capital. We have time for maybe one last question. Yes. Yeah, I was thinking, Lucian, uh, not, not, not so much of the, of the normative or regulatory or legal consequences, but what this tells us. I mean, if you, ha you have this firm SNAP, and it's perfectly plausible that ex po a firm that's going to be governed ex post in perpetuity by a 1% size shareholding is going to be, obviously, the, the value of those shares is going to be much lower than if they used a somewhat more sensible uh, not, I shouldn't say sensible, I don't want to bias this, but uh, if they use a, a, a somewhat more a normal uh, voting and governance structure. So they must have actually anticipated a very, very large financial loss from adopting this structure, uh, if, you're, if your argument's right, which means that they must actually value a great deal, uh, sort of in a, even in a non-economic way, an absolute way, dominance and control over this company. So, so if, we, if we take away dual class, uh, 
people with those sorts of preferences, are they going to still want to set up public companies? I mean, perhaps there's a very unique sure. utility function that the, uh, that yeah. the, that the, that the so, high-tech so, entrepreneur has. So we are kind of, we keep gravitating, as one would expect in an audience of financial economists, we keep gravitating to the contractarian question, right? It's, again, kind of the beauty of the IPO mechanism and that we should really defer and everything that happens at, at the IPO stage must be right for one reason or another. And uh, um, if you completely buy this, and you, know, you, you might, and there are many people certainly in any uh, audience that do, then, then, I'm just, then the, only, the only thing that the paper tells you is, look, if you are one of the many investors, you, he, you should think about this issue more than you might have thought about. You should look at the documents carefully, which we did, and look at this 1%, and you should look at the studies and see all of this. However, there might be some that might question whether there was kind of this perfect pricing at the IPO stage, because your underlying assumption was that they expected to for the price to be fully discounted by the expected value reduction no, over no, time. I'm not saying that. I'm oh. saying that they should have, even if you have imperfect pricing, I think that in, if you think that market participants are even reasonably sane, sorry, if you, if you think they're reasonably sane, uh, I would say that you, you would expect to get a lot less for a stock where essentially you're transferring complete ownership, uh, complete control over the firm, including constitutional authority, to, to right. an infinitesimal oh, sure. ownership stake. So there would, it, it might not be perfect pricing, but I would expect that, that, oh, the, uh, yes, that yes, the entrepreneurs yes. would expect a very right. a considerable discount. Right. There's no question, there's no question, I fully agree, that we have every reason to assume that those people attach value to control, which probably has a very significant component of non-pecuniary benefits, okay? Those people, you know, recall that many of the examples I was giving, the distortion was exactly arising. I mean, the non-pecuniary benefit is probably one reason why they wanted in the first place to have this structure. They are probably not planning to have massive amount of related party transactions, but they have non-pecuniary benefits. They are proud in what they accomplished, and they want to keep running it. Those non-pecuniary benefits is also exactly what might, down the road, produce very substantial agency problems. Because in 10 years down the road, when they might no longer be the right person to lead the company, they might say, we love leading this company. The forces of cognitive dissonance might tell them that they are probably the best people in the job, even if they are not. And they'll say, look, we have it in the contract. We told everybody we'll be uh, uh, around. So those non-pecuniary benefits are clearly there. They are probably the reason why uh, uh, they determine it this way. Uh, but also, they are one of the reasons why we should be worried that the agency distortions down the road are going to be quite large. I think on that note, we're going to have to end up here. But thank you very much, Lucian. And, uh, and thank you.